Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. And thank you to the organizers, uh, Dave Ashish and Jonathan, and everyone else involved for putting together this conference at the occasion of Sri Aurobindo's 150th anniversary. There are so many scholars here whose work I've been curious about for years, and others who I've discovered thanks to this event, so it's been great to be able to uh, participate. My name is Suryamai Clarence Smith, and I am joining to present my book, which is just being published by Bristol University Press, and is a scholarly autoethnographic exploration of the Orville community, which I was born and raised in, and I'm currently a member of. So the book is an adaptation of my PhD project, which I had the pleasure to present in person at CIS in 2018, at a conference organized uh, by Devashish and others as well, at the occasion of the 50th anniversary of both Orville and CIS. And it's wonderful to come full circle and present back the final outcome. I wish I could be there in person, but I'm grounded from air travel at the moment and the internet is also pretty patchy where I am, so hence the video. But I hope to be able to join you live for the Q&A. So we're coming to the end of this conference, and all of you here are familiar with Orville by now. There have been several other presentations made on the community over the last few days. And so I'm just really going to take you straight into a deep dive of the key uh, sort of scholarly contributions of this work rather than starting with a general introduction to Orville. And in keeping with the character of this conference, which is primarily paper-based, I'll actually be reading out some passages from the book along the way. And, uh, and I'll also offer some moments of contemplative pause. Those have been a really wonderful part of the event so far. So with that, I invite us all to take a couple of deep breaths. Um, perhaps even gently close our eyes. And with your eyes closed or just with your lids lowered, I'd like to invite you to allow an image of the Orville community to appear before you. Now it might be a memory from a time that you visited Orville, or maybe it's just a vision that appears to you in this given moment. It might also be that it takes a little while to come or that nothing visual comes to you and this is fine as well. So just be with whatever is there before and within you and notice any sensations or emotions that arise in your being in association with this. Take a nice few deep breaths breathing into whatever it is that you're experiencing. And then gently allow yourself to resurface, to open your eyes, and to return your attention to the room. So welcome back. Now that we've um, had a moment to each connect with Orville, which is at the center of today's presentation in a contemplative way. Let's dive into a more traditionally uh, analytical approach to the subject. So I'd like to begin by unpacking these big words in the title of the book, Prefiguring Utopia. And I'll start with utopia, the concept of utopia. And I'll be reading um, from the book as I do so. I'll be drawing from the book as I do so. So intentional communities such as Orville are often categorized as utopian projects. Although it's really important to know that this framing is actually contentious for many, from academics to intentional community members themselves. And now this is largely because of the dominant identification of the concept of utopia with a fixed ideal of perfection which many intentional community members feel that they are far from. And also its association with a detailed, predetermined blueprint, which is a source of concern due to the dogmatism that it can engender. Now, these associations with the word utopia 
are not without basis, but they are by and large outdated. So contemporary utopian scholars consider it to be mistaken to understand utopias as, quote, perfection seeking, blueprinting, or desirous of perfection and finality. And in the last several decades, there has been a radical move away from the idea of utopia as synonymous with perfection, fixity, and the intangible, towards that of an experimental practice that is dynamic, changeable, flexible, reflexive, and also self-critical, that is about a drive for perfectibility rather than perfection. Now, this evolutionary dimension and purpose of utopian practice, I find to be congruent with Orville's ontological framework of integral yoga, which seeks to hasten the spiritual evolution of consciousness through an, through an applied embodiment in the present. The utopian philosopher Ernst Bloch who is really to be credited for catalyzing the reformulation of the very concept of utopia, insisted that utopian ideals must be connected to potential embedded in existing reality, no matter how compromised the present conditions. Now this stands in very stark contrast to the conceptualization embedded in the very origin of the term utopia, which is a combination of two Greek words, utopos, or good place, and utopos, or no place. The implication being that utopia is an imaginary, abstract, and also unattainable ideal. So the mother conceived of Orville as an experiment dedicated to a sort of foreshadowed evolutionary practice, as envisaged by Bloch. And it's on this redefined basis that I use the concept of utopia as a theoretical lens, an analytical lens to understand the practice of evolving a new society that Orvidians are engaged in. So I wanna take a few moments to let that reformulation sink in. And to support another contemplative pause as you do so. I'd like to read you a quote by Oscar Wilde that I feel captures the essence of what I just shared in just a few evocative lines. He writes, a map of the world that does not include utopia is not worth even glancing at, for it leaves out the one country at which humanity is always landing. And when humanity lands there, it looks out and seeing a better country sets sail. Progress is the realization of utopias. So let's move on to our second big word which is prefiguration. And again from the book, prefiguration is central to how I understand utopian practice in the Orville context. Because prefiguration is a practice in which a collective emulates in the present the attitudes, social relations, culture, and organization that it envisions for the future through, quote, experiential and experimental means. Now, the term prefigurative was coined in 1970 by the cultural anthropologist Margaret Mead, who was an early endorser of the Oral Project, to herald the advent of a newly future-oriented prefigurative culture, one in which, quote, it will be the child and not the parent and grandparent that represents what is to come. 
Now, in 1977, the term prefiguration was first used to define the embodiment within the political practice of a movement of those forms of social relations, decision-making, culture, and human experience that are its ultimate goal. The context was the new left social movements, precipitated and shaped by radical changes in culture and lifestyle that arose in the 1960s, peaking in 1968, the year that Orville was founded, with the Students' Revolt in Paris, which the mother took a personal interest in. Now, in the last decade, or maybe even a bit more, the label prefigurative has risked becoming exclusive to horizontal forms of organizing and decision-making in social movements such as Occupy Wall Street. And this very restrictive scope is perhaps why prefiguration had barely been associated with utopianism when I started with my work. But it seemed evident to me that those articulating this form of prefigurative politics are driven by the desire to live in a radically different society, shaped by alternative values than that of mainstream capitalism. Capitalism understood not only as an economy, but a society. And it also seemed evident that such an alternative society needs to be prefigured in all its aspects, education, work, social relations. And this is where the prefigurative and the utopian seem to me to be evident allies. So I consider the utopianism as conceived and practiced in the orbital context to not only be prefigurative, but spiritually prefigurative because the premise of the Orwell project is to evolve and evolve into a spiritualized society through a transformational practice of informing everyday life and activities with spiritually enlightened ideals, values, and consciousness. Following Sri Aurobindo's iconic phrase, all life is yoga. Now, to use the same theoretical concept, in this case, prefiguration, to analyze both political and spiritual practice may seem like a stretch to some. But over the last 50 years, Orville has been a focal point for pioneering innovative forms of collective and economic organization, renewable technologies, sustainable architecture, educational practices, and social enterprises with award-winning local, regional, national, and international reach and impact. And I have heard several fellow Orvillians describe these as simply byproducts of the underlying spiritual mission of the community. So this active role of spirituality in reshaping society is especially interesting to consider given that a prevalent criticism of spiritual practice is that it renders individuals apolitical in the sense of disengaged from the shaping of society. Now, it's relevant to note that academic work endorsing this critique is based on Buddhist-inspired practices such as mindfulness, which do emphasize a detachment from worldly life. And by contrast, the spiritual worldview of integral yoga is one that sees the world as a realm to be divinized through a practice of cultivating not only, quote, spiritual consciousness within, but also spiritual life without. So engaging in pursuits of worldly life with an applied spirituality in order to participate in transforming these. So if the aspiration of Orvillians as a polity is an embodied individual and collective evolution of spiritual consciousness in everyday life, then I would argue that any activity in which they intentionally engage with this spiritually prefigurative process, whether a physical discipline, artistic production, in a political form, 
is fundamental to Orwell's development as a spiritual polity. As has been evoked throughout this conference and is deeply examined and elucidated throughout my book, Orwell is a society with many challenges and contradictions. Now in prefigurative practice, it is understood that quote, the struggle and the goal, the real and the ideal become one in the present. That it is a practice to be engaged within the limitations of a given present context with the objective, very practically, progressively, and ultimately transforming these. Because there is no utopia, the way it was historically conceived, right? All we have is our present context and our present realities. And this is where prefiguration, I think, is a very interesting and pertinent lens to apply to utopianism, as we understand it today. So in the book, I explore how the Orville community has engaged in a spiritually prefigurative utopianism throughout political, cultural, and economic realms of community life and development, while navigating contextual challenges both internal to Orville and to the broader political, economic, and sociocultural context in which it is embedded. We will not have the time today to fully delve or delve really at all into the content and findings of each of these chapters. So I invite you to read the book for that. But what I do want to address, given the focus on sustainability in this conference, is the sustaining of this overarching spiritually prefigurative utopian practice in the Orville context. So many scholars emphasize the role of hope as a primary and sustaining force for utopian endeavor. Ernst Bloch's work, who I mentioned before, is called The Principle of Hope. Um, now from autoethnographic observation and experience, I consider it necessary to add the dimension of disappointment as I found this to actually be key in fostering an ongoing drive for societal change within Oroville. And I would go so far as to extrapolate that it is the tension between these two forces, hope and disappointment, that can engender the dynamism at the core of utopian practice, certainly of grassroots utopian practice as practiced in Oroville is practiced in any experimental project. So criticism is a natural ally to disappointment. Tom Moylan, who is among the contemporary scholars of utopianism, recently published a book called Becoming Utopian, has defined some utopias as critical in what he calls both the enlightenment sense of critique, that is the expressions of oppositional thought, of unveiling, of debunking, and also in the nuclear sense of a critical mass. So to this double meaning of critical, I suggest that we add the dimension of self-critique in order to actually better understand the subjective experiences of utopian practice and intentional communities. Now, the dynamic of self-critique has already been highlighted by others, such as Lucy Sargison, for example, who observes that members are often excessively critical of their community. She's an intentional community scholar herself. Now, this is certainly true of Orville, and I would argue that it is one key to fueling a continued process of perfectibility as long as 
hope remains unseated. Now, of hope, Bloch says, it is in love with success rather than failure. Yet Frederick Jameson points out that utopias also have something to do with failure and tell us more about our own limits and weaknesses than they do about perfect societies. Sargison, who I mentioned before, has remarked that utopias are a mirror to the present designed to bring out flaws. While Lyman Tower Sargent was perhaps the foremost bibliographer of Utopia, remarks that Utopia is a life of hope. We can hope, fail, and hope again. We can live with repeated failure and still improve the societies we build. I'd like us to pause here and reflect on that. We can live with repeated failure and still improve the societies we build. I think one of the reasons why it's so tempting to criticize utopian projects is because they are engaged in the process of trying to improve societies. And I often wonder whether we shouldn't be more critical of societies and communities that are not trying. Um, in an earlier talk in this conference, Devashish evoked different um, sort of movements in which social reform was attempted, Marxism, communism, and that it was a psychological aspect that was missing from these previous experiments, attempts, conceptualizations. And I think that's also interesting to consider when we think of this quote, Utopia is a life of hope, we can hope fail and hope again. We can live with repeated failure and still improve the societies we build. It's about, from the psychological perspective, it's about being engaged in that process, dedicating ourselves to that process, which is key. And in my work, this is why I really focused on process and why I've highlighted that here. Because in the book, as you as you read it, you know, as you read how this plays out in different aspects of the community and you know how this has worked out and what has worked and what hasn't worked and all of these things, you know, that's fine and it's important. But for me, what was the most important was to understand what triggers this process. What is it that inspires? people to engage in utopian practice, in community, collectively, and inspires them to continue despite disappointments, despite failures, um, to carry on, to, to, to stay engaged in this process. And it was fascinating to see how important was the role of ideals and the role of the spiritual in this. And now those ideals might change from place to place. Um, the goals might change. The, out the desired outcomes might change. And so what I thought I might be able to contribute with my work is how can the process be engaged and sustained? So when we look at Oroville, the ideals of the community, as outlined in its founding text, so the Oroville Charter, to be a true Orvillian, a dream, they articulate and inspire the collective hope of the community. And at the same time, there are constant 
gauge against which Orwellians critique themselves and often each other. Now, the spiritual worldview of Antigua Yoga plays a really crucial role in framing and also assists in weathering our disappointment with the human limitations and flaws that we Orwellians routinely face in ourselves and others in community life and development. And according to this worldview, such limitations are symptomatic of the overarching stage of spiritual consciousness in which humanity is presently caught. Because it maintains that this spiritual consciousness is in a process of evolution and that we can choose to actively participate in it, this spiritual worldview is also key to sustaining hope. So as such, the spiritually prefigurative rootedness of the Orgo project is crucial to sustaining its utopian practice. And as I evoked earlier, this crucial role of spirituality in sustaining utopian practice is one of the key contributions of my work. And that ties in ever so neatly with the key themes, key themes being explored in this conference, which are arguably sustainability and spirituality. So on that fortuitous note, um, I'd like to close this talk, which also closes the conference and express my gratitude for spaces that allow us to engage with the role of spirituality in society in a dedicated way. Thank you. Um, also for those of you at CIIS, the book will soon be available in the library. It's being shipped as we speak. And the publisher is extending a 50% discount to all of you attending the conference. So the code is capital letters CON23 for online purchase on the Bristol University Press website. And there might be a poster um, lying around somewhere with these details. Um, so I'll stop the video here and be right with you for the Q&A, internet connection and land.